Greetings, this is Father John Brown again. I'm from the, the Holy Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church in Marietta, Georgia, and welcome to the 11th presentation in the series Introduction to Orthodoxy. We've had 10 in the past. We have, after this, apparently two more to go, so we might as well begin. When lived to its fullest, orthodoxy is a way of life. The first priority of this lifestyle is developing a habit of prayer. Prayer is how we communicate with God. Regular communication is essential for any significant relationship, and our relationship with God is no different. He always wants to hear from us. The church gives us a wide variety of cycles of prayer, ranging from the simple to the complex. We pick the cycles that we can maintain consistently. In addition to these prescribed prayers, we are also pre free to pray in our own words when we feel the need. In orthodoxy, all prayers are corporate in connection with the whole church, even when we are praying alone. This is a quotation from Bishop Callistus Ware, the writer of several books, including The Orthodox Church and The Orthodox Way. He writes, even when alone, we are still play praying with the church, using the words in countless parish churches and monasteries, Personal prayer is possible only in the context of the community. Nobody is a Christian by himself, but only as a member of the body. Even in solitude, in the chamber, a Christian prays as a member of the redeemed community of the church, and it is in the church that he learns his devotional practice. Naturally, the manuals are only intended as a guide, and all are at liberty also to pray spontaneously in our own words. The simplest pattern of prayer is morning and evening prayer. This can be found in booklet form, that booklet, the pocket prayer book. If you, uh, it's a very common one out there. You can find it on a variety of uh, vendors that sell it. Also at Holy Transfiguration, if you are connected with Holy Transfiguration, we sell this in our church bookstore. Or we can find morning and evening prayer online at Orthodox websites. And uh, I'm going to leave that on there as an uh, example so that you can look, look, at, for, look at it for a little while and, and jot it down or, or highlight, copy and paste it as you wish. And, but we can easily find morning and evening prayer online. Or, or we can also find it in the Orthodox Study Bible. This is an extremely valuable resource for all Orthodox Christians and is highly recommended. One other thing I will note about morning and evening prayer, they tend to follow certain patterns, but if you go from form to form to different different sources, you will find some variation. There's not one single universal format for morning and evening prayer. Some are longer, some are shorter, but the important thing is that we find a, a pattern that we can follow and that we can follow consistently. That's the most important thing. The next level of complexity are the prayers of the hours. These are prayers designated for specific times of the day and are normally said in private. They are monastic in origin, but can be followed by anyone. The specific hours of prayer are according to Roman reckoning, but correspond to modern times as, as follows. So in the Roman world, uh, they, they had midnight, pretty, pretty much like our midnight. The first hour was 6 a.m. or thereabouts. They were not as precise as we can be with our modern technology. The third hour was about what we would call 9 a.m. The sixth hour was about noon, and the ninth hour was about 3 p.m. And so you can, can see on the right there an example, a manual for the hours of the Orthodox Church in booklet form. This, if, if you would like to take your prayer life to the next level beyond morning and evening prayer, this would be a very good place to start. They're, these, they're relatively short. You could do each one in five, five or 10 minutes. They're not very long. They're heavy on the Psalms as well as prayers. And then we also have the daily services that are the next level of complexity of prayers. They are the services that are normally offered in community worship. They are all served in daily in monasteries and Vespers, Orthros, Divine Liturgy, and sometimes Compline are also celebrated in parish settings as needed, usually not every single day in a church 
as it would be at a monastery, but if you wanted to experience Vespers or go to Orthros or Divine Liturgy in a large parish such as ours, we have a pretty full schedule of services. You can find these services offered every few days. You would not have to wait very long. Each of these services is associated with a time of the day. Vespers is actually the first of the cycle of services because it is offered, theoretically at least, around sundown. In the ancient world, people didn't have watches as we do today, but they or other means to find out other times of the day, but everyone knew when the sun went down. So Vespers, for that reason, and in the ancient world, very often the day began at sundown because everybody knew when the sun went down. And that begins the liturgical day in the prayer cycles of the Orthodox Church as well. Compline is after dinner, usually a little later on in the evening beyond Vespers, and uh, it's sometimes called a bed, a bedtime prayer. Uh, midnight office is about midnight, as the name implies. Orthros is normally done leading up to and over dawn, so you'd have to get up early to, to to pray orthros if you were in a monastic setting or to pray it at the exact time it was intended. But of course, it's commonly done. You don't have to, you, you, you haven't missed orthros if you wait till a little later than dawn to pray orthros. Then we also have the divine liturgy, which is in the morning, normally in the cycle after orthros, unless it is combined with vespers, in which case it becomes a vesperal liturgy, which you, we do fairly rarely, and that would be an evening divine liturgy. Other services, like the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts and the Akathist hymn, are served during Great Lent. We are now, as I'm doing this, in Great Lent, so these two services are added as well as part of the, the liturgical cycle of the church during this, this special period. The supplications to the Theotokos is offered during the fast of August, meaning August 1st through 15th, leading up to and culminating in the, the feast of the Dormition or the falling asleep of the Theotokos. But it doesn't, this, this service of supplication is not limited to that. We can also use this at other times of the year. At our church, since it's a, pair, it's a service of supplication, early in the time of the rise of COVID, when there was a lot of anxiety out there, we offered this prayer uh, during the early phases of the, the COVID uh, th uh, about a year ago from the time that I'm doing this. A final important prayer of the Orthodox Church is the Jesus prayer. It's also called the prayer of the heart. This prayer is very simple and it goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This prayer is recited constantly throughout the day by monastics and is prayed repetitively by laymen as well. The central word in this prayer is the name of Jesus, which as we read in the book of Philippians is the name that is above every name. This prayer can be modified to fit the need of one praying, such as, Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have mercy on my sister who is having an operation today. We're very free. This is a very flexible prayer. We can apply it to whatever need that is on our hearts. The most important, the central the theme of this is the, the name of Jesus. It is commonly used in con conjunction with a prayer rope, a simple prayer rope with a specific number of knots to help one keep track of the number of prayers. So that's an example of a prayer rope. You see a picture there. there. They are knots. They come in a variety of different lengths. There's some as, as few as 12, and I've seen them go up to 100. And so this helps us keep track and also offers us a sort of a reference point and a focal point, at least for our bodies, as we are praying the Jesus prayer. And it's a beautiful prayer. It is ancient, prayed by the, the, the holiest of our saints, and our monastics continue this. They pray without ceasing this, this prayer. So this is a very valuable prayer. It's also a little bit simple, considerably simpler than the Catholic rosary, which is a little more complex and has certain cycles within the cycles. This is just a very simple prayer. It's, it's just a simple prayer just addressed to our Lord Jesus Christ. And you can say it twice or you can say it a thousand times. It's, it, it is a valuable source of spiritual reflection and supplication to our Lord. And there are other occasional prayers. There are countless 
Orthodox prayers for every occasion upon entering and leaving the church before and after meals, before study, before falling asleep, before beginning any task, for a sick person, for a journey, for both married and single persons, for a child, to your guardian angel, to your patron saint, and many more. Many of these can be found in booklets like this. This is the same one we saw earlier. This is just an example of a very simple, small, handy, and it's truly, it's not much bigger than you see in this picture, but it's a very valuable and handy book that contains many of these occasional prayers. Occasional prayers are available in other books, as well as online, or in apps like the Daily Readings, or Pray Always, etc. In Orthodoxy, and we want to put this in red, and I wanted to make sure everybody understood this, in Orthodoxy, it is perfectly acceptable and even can encourage to pray to God using our own words when we feel the need to do so. So just because the Orthodox Church has these orders of prayer that sort of help us develop a consistent prayer life, when we feel the need to pray to God on, in our own words, we are certainly free and encouraged to do so. Sometimes their only prayers that are appropriate are our own prayers. And so we see in Orthodox cycles of prayer is almost like a, all many cogs of a machine. So we have morning prayer is a cog. Then we also have the Jesus prayer. We also have evening prayer and supplications and orthros and divine liturgy and the hours and mealtime and compline and vespers and any number of, of other prayers that all tie together. They all are the constantly moving machinery as all human beings and all Orthodox Christians let our prayers rise to our Lord 24 hours a day, seven days a week as a church. And these are the forms and the times in which we do so. So it is our privilege to communicate to our God. In addition to the prayer cycles of the church, daily scripture readings are also appointed for each day of the year. This cycle of scripture readings is called a lectionary. Every day there are Psalms, a selection from the epistles, and sometimes the epistles actually come from the Old Testament, and there's always a passage from the Gospels. These are woven into the prayer cycles. They can be found in an online calendar or online. And to the right there, you see one of many apps. It's not the only one, but this is one used by many people. The Daily Readings app, the a mobile app that you can see there on the Greek Archdiocese website. You can download it. It's for free. You can download it. Download it. There's sort of a lighter and a, and a more heavy duty version that is extremely valuable to help us keep up with our prayer life and that we can keep up with the daily scripture readings and also the lives of the saints. Another valuable set of readings are accounts, accounts of the lives of the saints honored each day. And they're usually each day, there's several of them. They'll usually have five or six there, including usually, in most cases, a brief account of their life. So this is very valuable. So this is, for us Orthodox Christians, a very good place to do our one-stop shopping for our development and maintenance of our prayer lives. So th those are all provided in this app. Although there are others, this is one that, that I know best of all, and I refer to it very often. Now we come to the subject of Orthodox fasting. Why do we fast? Fasting has always been a Christian discipline. Our Lord fasted. In Matthew 4, we read, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. So our Lord fasted. So we know it's a good thing to fast. We have the highest example of, of our Lord to pursue this discipline to some degree. John the Baptist also fasted. We read in Matthew 3. Now John himself was, was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So this was a very meager type of diet that he sustained himself on. He did not pursue a very luxurious diet at all. And so this is a good example, another good example of us why, why we fast. Christ assumed that his followers would fast. He was addressing his followers in Matthew chapter 6. He says to them, 
When, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sound cat countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And so this is... This is a discipline that our Lord practiced in himself, and also he just assumed and uh, that his followers, followers would do that. And the Orthodox Church, as his followers, do keep a, a fasting discipline as a church. Orthodox Christians fast a lot. More precisely, we abstain from certain desirable foods for specific periods of time. It has nothing to do with the Old Testament kosher laws, where certain foods were forbidden, at all times, because they were inherently clean, excuse me, inherently unclean. We abstain from certain foods one day and enjoy it the next. To understand the orthodox practice of fasting, we must first understand the concept of the passions. These are normal human desires that in and of themselves are not sinful, but those human desires have a tendency to grow far beyond their natural boundaries and boundaries when, and then become sinful. For example, the human desire for food is natural, but can easily grow out of control and become harmful. Abstaining from certain desirable foods breaks our dependence on them. By fasting, we learn to control our appetites instead of letting our appetites control us. This is a wonderful internet article I put on the bottom that gives you a longer, more extended discussion about the, the purpose that we Orthodox seek through fasting. So when do we fast? There are several times when we fast as Orthodox Christians. These include most Wednesdays and Fridays during the season of Lent, which is six weeks leading up to Pascha or Easter, as it's called in the West. <clears throat> during the, the season of Nativity, which is five weeks leading up to Nativity or, or Christmas. And then there's the fasting season which is August 1st through 15th, leading up to the Dormition, which is uh, one of our holy days, commemorating the falling asleep of the Virgin Mary. Then there's also the Fast of the Apostles, which takes place leading up to the Feast of the Holy pa Apostles, which is June 30th. Unlike the other fasts, this fast varies in length. From uh, It can be as short as one day, and it can also stretch out to several weeks. There are other one-day fasts throughout the year as well. As just to, to, just to summarize, we fast about somewhere roughly about half the days of the year. By fasting, again, we're not talking about eating no food, food but restricting ourselves as to what, fine, what kind of food we eat. A couple of other fasts that we keep that are, in some ways, they're all important, but these are important to keep in mind. We keep a total fast beginning midnight before communing in the morning. So when the Orthodox wake up to prepare for going off to church where they intend to commune, we don't have breakfast, we don't have coffee. We, it's a total fast. We keep a total fast beginning around noon before communing in the evening. Some of our services, such as liturgy of these persons, the presanctified are in the evening. So for an evening communion, we begin fasting totally around noon. During this time, on either one of these times, we only consume medicines and water as necessary. So if you're on medication and you need water to wash down that medication, that is, that is absolutely permitted and, and, and encouraged. We do not ever want anyone to harm their, their health or their body as part of fasting. That is not the purpose of fasting. On fasting days, we also abstain from wine, except on days when wine is permitted. Here's a selection that summarizes, and that's on the Greek Orthodox website, specifically what types of foods we fast from. During all fast periods, those of sound health abstain from meat, fish, and all dairy products is observed, except when fish is permitted. Some days, even in a strict fasting period, today happens to be the Feast of the Annunciation. So this is one of those few days during Lent where we were permitted to have fish and I had fish for lunch and enjoyed it very much. So this is one of the, those uh, days where fish is permitted even if it's a fasting day. 
the use of vegetable oils is permitted during fasting periods, although olive oil may be only consumed on Saturday and Sundays of Lent. Imitation foods such as margarines and vegetable products of all kinds. So, uh, so I'm thinking of things like uh, the uh, Boca burgers and uh, and uh, there's some certain times of imitation meats that are actually made out of the vegetables. Those are permitted. Vegetable products of all kinds may be classed as classified as fast foods or fasting foods. Some seafoods such as shrimp, oyster, lobster, crab meat, octopus. Basically, shellfish that are invertebrate are considered permissible fasting foods. So if you want to see this discussed more in detail, hit pause and jot down that website link and you can read uh, far more on the subject. The following foods are permitted on all strict fast days. The shellfish, bread, grains, rice, pasta, nuts, fruits, vegetables, and legumes. There are many modified fast days, which are less strict. I already mentioned that on some days, uh, fish is permitted. And on some days, usually on weekends, wine and oil are also permitted. So you can see that it's not that we can't eat anything. It's just a very simple food that we are called upon to eat on fasting days. How do we know what, what uh, we're allowed to eat or not allowed to eat? To determine whether a day is a fast day, you can consult an Orthodox cal calendar, website, or app. I've mentioned this daily readings app that you can download every single day. If you, you call it up and it'll tell you whether let that day is a fast day and if it's a fast day, if there are any uh, restrictions on, on things like cheese or wine or, or, or other things. So uh, there's another place that you can look at it, which would be on a website. You can download these and or you can buy a paper calendar, this Orthodox calendar that shows what you're allowed to have. If you're Orthodox Christian, how, you, how you're supposed to approach fasting on that day. So here's an example of a typical appearance of an Orthodox fasting website or, 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 or um, calendar. We had Forgiveness Sunday. You can see that little symbol up there it says you could have cheese because that's actually a little uh, symbol of cheese. If you see the Red Cross, that means all the fasting restrictions are in place. And then on the first Saturday of Lent, we are allowed to have wine because you can see that symbolized in the, the grapes and so forth. Today is the Annunciation. So you can see on that calendar on the screen there on the, on the 25th, where it says Annunciation, you can see a little fish there. That's, that tells us when we consult this calendar that we are allowed to have fish today. And so th these are very handy ways where we never need to wonder what we are allowed to have or not allowed to have on a particular fasting day. There are exemptions, and these are important exemptions that must be borne in mind. Certain people are exempted from fasting. One is infants and small children. There's no nothing to be gained for infants and small children to be required to fast. It's not probably not very good for them. And the, the universal rule is anything that harms your body, the church was not, would not want you to do. So that's this, the beginning of, uh, of this principle. Women who are pregnant or nursing are exempted from fasting. They have uh, a child either nearby or within them and they get the priority. Also, anyone with a medical condition where fasting might be harmful to their bodies, and this can be anything, many people who are diabetic, is not, there are many people who have diabetes, and it's to the point where not eating anything for a significant power, a pound, a amount of time would not be good for them. And so for anyone who is diabetic, for whom fasting would be dangerous to their health, they are, they are exempted from and actually encouraged not to fast. And this can be anything. A person who is living in a situation where fasting food is not available, and this happens sometimes. I put this picture of soldiers in, in, in uh, a war zone, and that applied to me for, eight, for 18 months of my life, where if you're in a war zone and you have no choice but to eat what they serve at the chow hall that night or in your rations, and so for situations like that, people who, are, uh, who do that are in that situation or any situation where fasting food is not available, 
then they're exempted from the fast. Also, there's a tradition where if you are Orthodox and you are invited as a guest to a meal at someone's home, usually a non-Orthodox home, and they serve food that is not fasting food, the tradition of the church is to, to we don't want to be uh, offensive to as a guest to our hosts we want to be appreciative of their hospitality so the, the the custom is and the tradition is to go ahead and eat whatever it is that they're serving just eat uh just just enough to be polite but don't gorge ourselves on on non-fasting food when this, it, this takes place on a fasting day a few more things to point out but are important considerations when it comes to fasting one is the Orthodox Church has its standards of fasting, but we're also a church populated by people. And I, I want to make it clear to all that not everybody in the Orthodox Church rises to the same level of fasting as other people. Some people are very, very, very uh, strict on themselves and keep the fast beautifully and with with great reward and with, with great effort on their part. And they, they, are, they are to be commended for that. We have other Orthodox people who fast very little, but uh, so the, as you can see on the long, on the bottom there, this is the probably how Orthodox, if you were to pick whatever this number is and ask and check and see how they keep with the fast. Some do quite well, some do pretty well, some not so good and some not so good at all. But this is really left up to the person. It is important for us to not ever become judgmental and and how another person is keeping the fast that's more or less between them and god and their spiritual father and so so anyway we don't want to obsess if we are keeping the fast very well and we see someone who is not that we know that they're orthodox we just let that let that go that's not something that we we should deeply involve ourselves in in fasting especially when just beginning it is important to consult with your spiritual father to discuss what degree of fasting is best for you. As I mentioned before, most Orthodox use substitutes to some degree. So such people use margarine instead of butter, almond or soy milk instead of cow milk, soy meat instead of uh, regular meat, etc. There are a number of ways to find a level of fasting that is right for you. The key is to find a level that is genuinely challenging, but that you can man maintain consistently. That's the key. If you can't do it perfectly, certainly starting out, then talk with your spiritual father and work out a level that is be below the maximalist standard, uh, and, and and one, but one that you can you can live with. You know that you can do with with effort. It's designed to be difficult, just like weightlifting or athleticism or things like that, but. And as, it, as in all things that are difficult for us, we sometimes fail. Do not be discouraged if you fail. Most every Orthodox can tell you about times or seasons in their life where they do not keep the fast very well. And if that happens, simply start all over again. And that's all that is asked. We just get back. If we fall off the wagon, we get back on the wagon and keep going. That's not, that should, the, the fast should not drive us to despair. I have found in fasting that one of the best, better spiritual results or lessons that I learn is that I'm not so strong as I think I am. And when I, when I do not do as well as I should in fasting, then I realize this is why I need Jesus to heal me of my passions. Also focus, I think I mentioned this earlier, focus on your own fast and do not pay attention to how others are fasting. And remember, this is important. This is why I put it in red. Finally, remember that fasting is not the goal, but an exercise towards the goal. Learn, and what is the goal? Learning to bring our passions under God's and our control. This is like what athletes do to get ready for an athletic competition. They lift weights and they run and they study the, the playbooks and they practice their, their skills, whatever their skills may be, in preparing, preparing themselves for competition and so that's sort of the mindset we should have when, when we are fasting uh I, sometimes I, I knew a runner one time who was a long distance runner and it was pouring down rain and he missed the day because doing his running because it was storming outside and lightning so one day he could simply could not run and he was 
reproaching himself for that. But missing one day did not make, make him a significantly worse runner. And so we have to be understand the challenge and strive to meet the, the challenge. But again, this is just the tool, the, not the goal. But the goal is to learn to bring all of our passions, starting with that of the appetite, under God's and our control. Now we'll talk a little bit about worship. The English word worship comes from joining two other English words, worth-ship. Worship is the act of recognizing and expressing the extreme worth of another, in this case, to God. This is a concept that really worship should not, is, is not foreign to anybody when we understand what it truly is. When we fall in love, we instinctively delight in expressing our deep emotions toward the person that we love. When we go to a concert, we instinctively cheer for our favorite musicians who are performing. When we go to a sporting event, we automatically shout our support for our team. If we go to a political rally, we loudly proclaim our allegiance to a candidate or a policy that we hold dear. We are actually all created to be worshiping beings. If we know how to express worth to loved ones or express worth or appreciation to sports teams and candidates, should not all the more we express more profound worth to God who created us, sustains us, died and rose for us, constantly bless us, blesses us and is saving us? The Orthodox Church worships according to a liturgy. You probably have heard that word before. This means we follow a set order in all of our services with pre-written prayers and hymns and actions of the clergy. The word liturgy comes from the Greek word liturgia, which, which means the work of the people, because the people are called to be active participants throughout the services. They participate in the prayers either silently or aloud. Some modern Christians dislike liturgical worship. They believe it is vain repetitions, and I put that in quotes, which Christ warned against in Matthew 6, verse 7. It is true that liturgical prayers, if merely recited without participation of the heart or, me or mental participation, will have little to benefit from to the one praying. But this is also the same danger for those who pray non-liturgical prayers. It is clear from Scripture that God loves liturgy. He commanded his Old Testament people to work to worship liturgically. Critics of preset prayers often overlook the fact that there are 150 preset prayers in the Old Testament. They are called the Psalms. They were all prayers set to music and sung by choirs exactly like the like the Orthodox Church does today. Interestingly, many Protestants who reject liturgical prayers because they say it's it's vain repetitions because there's somebody else's words and we're just saying them and therefore it doesn't benefit us. Those same Protestants who reject liturgical prayers have their own rich heritage of prayers set to music. Their classic beloved hymns like How Great Thou Art or Abide With Me or Great Is Thy Faithfulness or Countless Others are all prayers to God set to music and sung in community just as the Orthodox does, the Orthodox do. Yet no Protestant would call these beloved hymns vain repetitions. According to the Bible, heaven is a very liturgical place. It has preset prayers, just like the Orthodox Church. We read in Isaiah, in, in Isaiah's vision of heaven, it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the heaven, filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. When, and one cried out to another saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So this holy, 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 a shouting of worship to, to God by the angels in heaven. We see that that was that was seen by Isaiah in before centuries before Christ. The same thing was happening when John saw the same heaven in the first century. In his 
book in the Bible, Revelation, John writes, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. So this prayer of praise to God, this worship of God, and what we in, the, in Orthodoxy call the Trisayu and Him, was is, is a continuous, nonstop preset prayer to God by his angels. Heaven has icons, just like the Orthodox Church. John had a vision of heaven, and he said this, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. So we see a lamb in heaven. Now, John also saw our Lord Jesus Christ seated upon his throne, but he also saw a lamb. There is a lamb in heaven. It is not only Christ, but it is also a visual symbolic representation of Christ, in this case, in the form of a lamb. As such, it is an icon in the same way all of our icons of Christ are, visual symbolic representations of Christ. Heaven has robes, just like the Orthodox Church. John writes, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Heaven has incense, just like the Orthodox Church. John records, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, altar which was before the throne. So in, God has incense in heaven. Heaven has an altar, which in all cultures, an altar is a place of sacrifice. Heaven has an altar, just like the Orthodox Church. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. That's in Revelation 16, 7. The Orthodox Church has, has an altar. All Orthodox churches have an altar as in place of our sacrifice, which is of the Eucharist, of the body and blood of Christ. Christ has prostrations, excuse me, heaven has prostrations at times, just like the Orthodox Church. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. This time of year, especially, which is during Lent, you will notice at our services, particularly in, in the Liturgy of Presanctified and also in uh, the Compline services, we prostrate this time of year, do prostrations this time of year, especially more so than any other time. So when we do our prostrations, we are imitating the prostrations of the heavenly hosts before the throne of God in heaven as recorded by John. Now, we'll look at a major significant difference between liturgical versus non-liturgical worship. Any Christian from a non-liturgical background who walks into an Orthodox church and experiences a liturgy for the first time notices a completely different feel. They usually can't put their finger on it, but they can tell this is very, very different. The whole sensation that you get in an Orthodox church is very different than the sensation you would get when you go to most other churches, especially Protestant churches. This is because there is a major difference between liturgical and non-liturgical service in what they are trying to accomplish. They have two different uh, paradigms at work here. In a non-liturgical service, the purpose is to transmit information from the preacher to the people. Put another way, the preacher is the performer and the people are the audience. Usually the centerpiece of most Protestant worship is the sermon. That's the centerpiece. That's why you go to church more than any other reason. And so the centerpiece of the sermon is the minister, the preacher, proclaiming truth to the people, usually from the scriptures, and that's the purpose. You go to church to hear a sermon preached by, by the preacher. 
That's the, the centerpiece of non-liturgical Protestant worship. But in liturgical worship, as practiced in the Orthodox Church, the priest and the people as a whole are the performance performers. Remember, the word liturgy means work of the people, and God is the audience. As you can see here in this diagram, the main purpose, we do have preaching in, in our service, but the main reason we go to church as Orthodox is not necessarily just to hear the sermon. We go there to experience the presence of God. And so you see here the people, instead of focusing on the words of the preacher, are called to focus upon God himself. The church, the Orthodox church has been described by some people who I, I've talked to who have come into the church for the first time. They said, this is like entering God's throne room. And they're exactly right. This is not, this is much more a representation of heaven, a representation of the presence of God as first and foremost. And the focus is on God. The, the role of the priest is to assist and lead the worship of God by the people, since that's what the word liturgy means. And that's an entirely different paradigm for why we go to church in liturgical worship versus those who go to church in non-liturgical services. Now we will take a few moments to look at Orthodox worship in the form of the sign of the cross. Now I'd like to show you how the Orthodox make the sign of the cross. In some ways, it's similar to the Catholic way of making the sign of the cross, but ours begins a little differently. In the Catholic Church, they touch their, their fingertips to the head and heart and shoulders. We start with our hands this way, which is a little different. These three fingers are united together, which symbolizes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit united into one Godhead. These two fingers are put together and against the palm symbolizing the divinity and the human humanity of Christ united into one person. Then the first place we touch is our foreheads. This is because the head is where our brain is. This is where we think. This is a seat of our intellect. And so therefore we are praying and blessing our heads in effect saying, may the Holy Trinity bless my thinking. The next place we touch is about the middle area, about here, no exact spot, somewhere around this area. What we are therefore blessing and praying is may the Holy Trinity bless my heart. We know biologically it's not true, but symbolically over the millennia, the heart has been thought of as the source of our emotional life, the seat of our emotions. So therefore, when we touch this part, we are both praying and blessing that the Holy Trinity would bless our feelings. Then we, our next stop is to touch our shoulders, first the right and then the left. The shoulders are the, the basis of our arms and the arms are the basis of our hands, essentially most of what we do uh, every day. So by doing this, we are invoking the Holy Trinity to bless our actions. Sometimes there's a fourth addition to it, to the sign of the cross. This is not an essential part of the sign of the cross. It occurs either before or after the others that come together. Uh, but this, sometimes it's appropriate to take the hands and then place them as close to the ground in front of us as we can. This would therefore symbolize our blessing and prayer saying, may the Holy Trinity guide my paths. I'll talk a little bit about when to make the sign of the cross during the liturgy. The first time to make the sign of the cross, most obvious sign is when we hear the Holy Trinity invoked. So whenever we hear in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, O oh, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, that would be a time that we would definitely make the sign of the cross. Another time might be during the great entrance, although that's really when we make the sign of the cross during the great entrance, we're not actually uh, commemorating or honoring the, the, the gifts because they are not yet the body and blood of Christ. They had not been consecrated yet. What we are actually doing during the great entrance is we are making the sign of the cross as the cross itself passes by us leading the procession in the great entrance. So that would be another time to do it. Another time to make the sign of the cross would be as we are, we are approaching for Holy Communion. We don't want to do it 
immediately before taking communion because there's a possibility we want to avoid where by making the sign of the cross where we do this we might nudge and jar the the, the chalice co containing the holy gifts so the time to do that would be just before we take communion while we're still a step or two away one other thing uh, this is important to understand it is welcome and and certainly wonderful to make the sign of the cross anytime during the liturgy or or any time of life when we feel so moved by the holy spirit once we believe see something or hear something that draw brings us closer to god if we want to express our love and devotion to god then it is very appropriate at that time to make the sign of the cross as well anytime There's, you can do it whenever you want to so this this part this teaches us how and when the whole, how, when to make the sign of the cross, both in and out of the Holy Liturgy. Here's an excellent video on the sign of the cross, which goes into more detail. It's put out by Trisayun Films. Here's the link to see it. So I encourage anyone who wants to have a deeper uh, discussion of the sign of the cross, what it means and when, when to make the sign of the cross, I recommend this video. This concludes today's class. Thank you for coming. And this we will continue this class of the Introduction to Orthodoxy next week. Have a blessed day.